Amen. Amen. Well, it is so good to see you here today. Uh, thanks for joining us online. If you're watching online, we're so glad that you are there. Uh, how about that weather today? Was it amazing? It was so absolutely amazing. It was great. After I got out of the shower for today, my girls looked at me and said, Daddy, are you wearing makeup? I had to run and look in the mirror to make sure I wasn't wearing makeup. And I saw that one cheek got sunburned today. This cheek got sunburned today. I need to clarify. It's so, uh, such an awesome place to live, Lake Havasu City. It's such a beautiful place. Uh, last week, we finished up our series on the book of Acts. And today, we're kicking off about a three-week series uh, on, uh, focusing on the Christmas story. So if you have your Bible or a Bible app, you can turn to Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. And if you're using one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, you can turn to page 1016. And as always, if you're here today, maybe for the first time, or you've heard us say this, a thousand times. If you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, please take the Bible located underneath, underneath the seat in front of you, home with you, read it, and apply it to your life. Because we believe that the Bibles that sit underneath our seats all week long, if they're not being used, it's of no use to anybody. So we'd rather you take the Bible home with you, read it, and apply it to your life, and you will see God show up and change your life. Well, Christmas, as Pastor Chad has already said, and as you already know, Christmas has snuck up on us again. It's already here. Six days away is Christmas Eve. Can you believe that? Yeah. The enthusiasm in this room right now is off the charts for Christmas. <laughs> raise your hand if you still have some Christmas shopping to do. All right, raise your hand if you're all done with Christmas shopping. Raise your hand if your spouse still needs to go out Christmas shopping for you. <laughs> Better get busy. So a couple years ago, my daughter Sophie and I, we were driving across the state of Arkansas. It was in December, it was close to Christmas, and we stopped at a Chili's for lunch. And as we're at the Chili's, we got up and we walked around the corner and there in his bright red suit and his black belt and black boots and red pointy hat was Santa Claus. He, all of a sudden, just out of the blue, gray beard, old man, Santa Claus looked exactly like him if it wasn't him. So Sophie at that time was about eight years old, nine years old, and she just stopped and her mouth hung open in like amazement. There was Santa at a Chili's in Arkansas in the middle of December. Now, Santa, at first we thought, okay, this is gonna be a great encounter. Well, it got creepy. Santa bent over on his knees and he looked right into Sophie's eyes and he smiled. So Sophie smiled back and she said, hi, Santa. And Santa never said anything. He just kept looking at her with a smile on his face. And it got awkward. Santa, Sophie said, hi, Santa, thinking maybe he didn't hear her the first time. And he just stared. And you could feel the tension. It was awkward. And finally, Sophie broke the tension by looking up at me and saying, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, sometimes when Santa shows up in the life of a child, we don't get the results that we were hoping we would see. Sometimes he shows up and it can be a scary thing to some children. Uh, check this out on the screen for an instance. Sometimes Santa shows up and things get a little weird. Go to the next picture. We don't always get the results that we'd hope for. How many of you have a picture of either you or your child like that on Santa's lap? Yeah. I think Santa Claus can be an overwhelming thought to some children. Think about it. Think about that Christmas song. He knows when you've been sleeping. That's a little creepy. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so? Yeah, that's a little creepy. And then all of a sudden, they've been looking forward to Santa showing up, and then they're plopped in his lap. This is a guy that's been staring at them all year long. And to make matters worse, now he sends an elf on the shelf to their houses to watch them. 
No wonder some children are afraid of Santa and they don't want to get near him. He's really overwhelming. They like the thought of Santa from a distance. They like singing about him and looking forward. But the reality is when they see Santa who sees everything, knows everything and watches them when they're sleeping, it can be a little overwhelming. It's like, Joe, what does that have to do with Luke chapter 1? Well, I think also when God shows up in the lives of followers of Jesus, it can also be overwhelming. Uh, I think that for some adults, God is overwhelming. The everlasting, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient God who is all-powerful and all-knowing, I think is an overwhelming thought to many people. That God is all powerful, he's everywhere, he's all knowing, it's a lot to take in. And it gets even crazier when we understand as followers of Jesus that that great, omnipotent, all powerful God wants to use me and you for his kingdom and for his glory. That he wants to use us to impact the lives of other people when he's able to do whatever he wants, anytime he wants, yet he chooses to use us. In today's passage, Mary learns from an angel that God wants to use her to be the mother for God's son named Jesus. And as we look at this passage of scripture, I'm gonna highlight a few characteristics about Mary. And I believe that some of the characteristics that Mary demonstrates in this passage are signs of what it looks like for followers of Jesus to be maturing as followers of Christ. And if we really want God to use us, then maybe some of these characteristics we need to make sure are implemented in our lives as well. So let's read together Luke chapter one, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, it doesn't matter how many times I read this passage or see a nativity scene. In my mind, Mary is always about a 30-year-old woman when the angel shows up and appears to her. And maybe that goes back to my Catholic upbringing of all the the statues that I saw around the house and in the church that I went to. But I just see Mary as an older woman, about 30, who loved God. But scholars tell us that Mary was roughly between the ages of 13 and 15 years old. That's young. I mean, she was a kid, even by those standards, when they they believed at the age of 13, a Hebrew boy has become a man. It was still young for a kid. In fact, she could be my daughter Sophie's age right now. My daughter's 13. And I can't imagine what that moment was like for this 13 to 15 year old young teenager uh, to uh, have the angel of the Lord appear to her. But at this age, Mary already demonstrated characteristics of the type of person that God uses. 
And if you're like me, I know I'm still in the process of becoming the person of God that he has called me to be. I, I look back now and I, in many ways, I'm not the dad that I thought I was going to be when we started having children. In many ways, I'm not the husband that I thought I was going to be when I married my wife 21 years ago. In many ways, I've not become the pastor that I thought God was calling me to be. And so if you're like me, you probably have said, man, there are many other areas I need to continue to grow in my life. See, God's not done with me yet. And God's not done with you yet either. Not only in, in the uh, areas of service that he wants you to do, but also in the character, who he's shaping you to be. God's not done with you. He's not giving up on you. He loves you, and there's more about your character that he wants to impact in this life. You know how I know that? Take your two fingers and place them on your wrist. If you have a pulse, God wants to continue to shape your character and mold you into the husband, into the wife, into the mother, the father, the son, the daughter, the person that he's created you to be. So if like me, you want to become the type of person that God uses to bless others and to make an impact in Lake Havasu City and in Parker and around the nation, wherever you're watching us from, first understand that God works through people of faith. God works through people of faith. Think about this. God chose Mary, a teenage girl, to raise Jesus. Now, I, I've seen a lot of wonderful teen mothers, and maybe that was one of you out here today or watching us online, that, that you raised a child and you yourself were a child. But it blows my mind that God would actually choose to use a teen girl to raise Jesus. He did not choose a seasoned mother. He did not choose a, a seasoned woman. He didn't choose a 30-year-old who had been walking with God and worshiping God. He chose a teenager. And because Mary would become pregnant outside the bounds of the bond of marriage, she would be viewed as a disgrace to her family, to her friends, and to her community. She would be considered a girl with loose morals. And in fact... Because she would become pregnant outside of the bounds of marriage, uh, according to the Old Testament law, Joseph would be able to drag her to her mother's, uh, to her father's doorstep and stone her because she'd proven that she couldn't wait for them to get married before she decided to have sex. God chose a teenage girl for this type of life. So why did he choose Mary? Because God knew that Mary's faith in him was deep enough to carry her through the hard situations in life that she was going to experience. That he knew Mary's faith in him was deep enough to carry her through the shame, through the disgrace, through the rumors, through the gossip that she would face as she carried Jesus to term and then raised him as a boy. And it was because of her faith in God, she found favor with God. Her faith was strong enough to carry her through the public shame. Her faith would carry her through the, the difficult conversation that she was going to have to have with Joseph. Her faith in God would carry her through the conversations uh, with her parents when she's looking her dad in the eye and saying, Dad, I promise it's the Holy Spirit's baby. Her faith that she had, God knew it was going to be strong enough and deep enough to walk her through the hard situations in life. See, that is what faith does. Faith carries us through the hard and difficult seasons. Faith is our dependency upon God that he carries us through hard, confusing, and sometimes embarrassing seasons of our lives. The author of Hebrews defined faith as this in Hebrews 11.1. 1. 
He writes, faith is a confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Later, he writes in verse six that it is impossible to please God without faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Faith hopes for things that hasn't yet happened. And God knew that Mary's faith was strong enough to pull her through. So let me ask you a question. Do you have faith in God? Faith in God begins by surrendering our lives to Jesus. So let me ask you, do you confidently believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins? Do you confidently believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Do you confidently believe that your sins have been forgiven? Do you confidently believe that one day Jesus is going to come back? And if your answer to those questions are yes, then you have faith in God. And if those answers to your yes are yes, but you've not yet surrendered your lives to Jesus and received Christ as your savior, I want you to know that our prayer team will be here down at the front and they would love to help you understand how to begin a relationship with God by surrendering your life to Christ and receiving him as your savior. So uh, let me ask you this. If your answer to those questions are mixed, if you're like, well, I do believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins, but I don't fully get how he rose from the dead. Or I don't fully understand. I believe that he rose from the dead because we don't have a grave there, but I'm not really sure that he's going to come back. I want you to know something. We're all in a journey of faith and we're all growing in our faith. All you have to do is ask God to increase your faith. Ask God to help you to believe more. Simply say to God the very same words a man said to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Which means, Lord, I believe, help me to believe more. And so if there are challenges, challenges that you have in, in, in regards to what you believe about Jesus and what you believe about the Bible and what you believe about God, God is able to increase your faith if you ask him to help your unbelief. And remember this, as followers of Jesus, our faith grows when we choose to spend time with God. When we choose to spend time reading his word, when we choose to spend time praying, uh, even when we don't feel like it, when we choose to spend time with God, our faith increases. And confessionally, I got to say to you, I've been feeling a bit spiritually dry lately, going through the motions, doing what I know is right, but not necessarily growing in my faith. And so I would ask that you would pray for me and pray that my time with God would be refreshing, that it would be, be good, that it would be life changing. Uh, pray that I'd get out of the bed and pray in the mornings instead of pulling the blanket back up over my head and waiting for the girls to get up. Uh, pray that I would continue to serve God on a regular basis. How about you? Is your faith growing? If not, ask him to help you too. So God works through people who have faith in him. And secondly, we see that God works through people who trust him. Now, when I say that with those words, Mary doesn't necessarily look like she conveys a heart of trust right off the bat. She asks the angel the question in verse 34, how can this be? Uh, she said, how will this be since I am a virgin? All of us would immediately say, spot on. How can she get pregnant? She is a virgin. And it may seem a bit of a, a difficult way or an uncomfortable way of demonstrating a trusting heart. But if you know this Christmas story, you see in this passage of scripture that the angel refers to Elizabeth having a child within her womb. In verses of chapter one, verses five through 17, we see that there was a priest named Zechariah who happened to be Mary's uncle. And 
Zechariah was married to Elizabeth and they were advanced in years and he was an old priest and he was doing his priestly work in the temple and an angel of the Lord showed up about six months prior to showing up to Mary and said, the angel of the Lord has appeared. I'm going to trust that that's my whisker poking into the microphone. What do you think? Steve's pointing at me, so we'll bend it out a little bit. So for Zechariah, he was doing the priestly work. He was doing what he, thank you, sir. He was doing what God called him to do. An angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, told him he was going to have a son who would be used by God in great ways. That's John the Baptist, if you want to know how that fits in. But instead of trusting that God would do what he promised, Zechariah said to the angel in verse 18, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now and my wife is also well along in years then the angel said I am Gabriel I stand in the very presence of God it was he who sent me to bring you this good news but now since you didn't believe what I said you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born for my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time in this chapter one of the Gospel of Luke, there's two angelic appearances, one to Zechariah, one to Mary, who would be the mother of Jesus, and they both kind of responded the same way, but for Mary, it was received as a trusting heart. One was an old priest, supposedly mature in his faith, active in serving God, and the other is a simple teenage girl. The priest's reaction to the message suggested he had some doubt. He said, how can I be sure of this? What was he asking God for? He was asking God for proof. He was asking the angel for proof that what he said was going to happen. But Mary's re reaction was simply for clarification. She said, how will this be? I'm 13 years old. I've never been with a man and you're telling me that I'm going to have a child not give me a sign so I can believe this, not convince my parents of this truth. She said, how? She trusted, but she said, how? Zechariah doubted and said, my wife and I are way too old. Let me encourage you as followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And if you sense the Holy Spirit prompting you to do something, Trust in the Lord and do it. If you sense God prompting you to do something from the Bible as you're reading through scripture and praying and talking to God and saying, how do you want to use me? And as you sense God speaking to you in regard to your relationship with your wife, your, your husband, your child, your son, your daughter, your grandchildren, the people around you, if you sense God prompting you to do something, let me encourage you, be obedient and trust and do it because God chooses to work through people of faith and God chooses to work through people who trust him. And also God works through people who have a servant's heart. Do you see the words that Mary said in verse 38? She said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you have said. There are all sorts of responses that Mary could have given the angel in this moment. There are all sorts of responses that I would want my daughter to give to the angel in that moment. Mary, Mary could have said when the angel said, I've got a plan for you, she could have said, hold up, I'm already engaged. I, I'm gonna marry a guy named Joseph. I don't want you to change my life the way that you're about to change my life. She could have said, please, go find somebody else, but she didn't. And instead of trying to convince the angel to change his mind or tell God that she was unhappy with God's plan, she simply accepted the plan and she submitted to God's leadership in her life. And she said, I'm the Lord's servant. Man, that's a big mature thing for a 13 to 15 year old to do. In fact, that's a big thing for a 47 year old man to do. And that's a big thing for whatever age is you are right now. If you're willing to say, God, I know what you want me to do and I accept your plan 
for my life, that is a huge sign of spiritual growth and maturity because a servant do or does what they are asked to do. That's the role of a servant. And every household across the United States or around the world, anybody that has a servant, which we don't have, but their role is to do what they're asked to do. It may be the exact opposite of what they want to do, but they will do it because of their relationship to their master. And because Mary had a servant's heart, her life was forever changed. Because Mary had a servant's heart, she was willing to lay her plans down and accept the, God, accept the plans that God had for her life. So let me ask you a question. Do you consider your life as a servant to God? Do you consider your life as a servant of the Lord? See, if you're a follower of Jesus, there was a moment when you surrendered your life to God. There was a moment when you said, I am no longer living for myself. I'm now living for you, Jesus. And you surrendered your life to him and you called him Lord and Savior. And you know what that means. You said when you called him Lord, you, Lord, I want you to be the boss of me for the rest of my life. That's what that word Lord means. You gave up your life. So let me ask you this. Maybe it's been a few years since you gave your life to Jesus. Do you still consider him the boss of your life? Are you still willing to lay your marriage down and your relationship with your spouse down at his feet on a regular basis and say, God, help me to become the spouse to my, my wife that you've called me to be, the husband to my wife that you've called me to be. Help me to be the wife to my husband that you've called me to be. Do you still lay your fatherhood down at the feet of the cross and say, God, help me to be the father that you want me to be to my children. Keep changing me. Are you willing to be called by God a servant? Are you willing to consider Jesus still the boss of your life? If that's, if that's you, if that's the case and you're still looking for ways to serve, I want to encourage you to, to, to do, do yourself a favor. If you're looking for ways to serve because Jesus is the boss of your life, reach out and grab a serve card located at the seat back in front of you. It's green, it looks just like this. Put your name and information on there and check on the boxes on the back of areas that you're maybe thinking about serving in. Because if you are indeed a servant and you're already serving in your family and you're already serving your friends and your neighbors and you're serving in your community, maybe it's time you started serving inside the church. I don't say that to make you feel guilty, but I say that to encourage you. There's incredible joy found as we serve one another in the life of the church. And so fill that out and check a box and drop it in the offering boxes in the back of the room. Uh, we just want to help you get connected and serve in any way that you can. Now, as I think about this and as I've been thinking through this message, I've wondered if there was something that God wants me to do here in Havasu, but he chose to use somebody else because maybe I'm not displaying the growing characteristics of, uh, of a mature Christian that I ought to have. Maybe he found somebody else because I said I was too busy or maybe I was too tired or maybe I lacked the genuine faith that he was leading me to do something. Because make no mistake about it, God is still searching today to use people here in Lake Havasu and in Parker and around this nation. He's still searching for people to use. Second Chronicles 69a says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, searching to strengthen those whose hearts are loyal to him. And I wonder how many times God's eyes have passed over me because I don't want to be the type of person that God overlooks. I want to be the type of person that God uses I want to be the type of person that God is looking for. And I know I still have a long way to go. What about you? 
Are you becoming that person that God is looking for? Are you becoming that type of person that God wants to use? Let me encourage you this Christmas season, even in the midst of the pace that Christmas season brings, focus on simply becoming the person that God wants to use to bless others and to make an impact. And let me remind you that that path, as we've looked at in the, in the, the, the letter of Acts or the book of Acts, can be quite challenging. Uh, the path that God calls you to as a servant, look at Paul's life and look at Peter's life and look at Mary's life. God always calls us to do something hard and difficult, and sometimes it's not received well around our community. But you can also be assured that God will be with you every step of the way. God uses people who are faithful, who trust in him, and who have... Uh, <laughs> the third point, whatever the third point was. But God uses those type of people who are trusting him in and who have a servant's heart. And when God finds people like that in this world, he will use them and he'll use you to make a difference. Do you want God to use you to make a difference? I do. So let's pray that we become the type of people that God chooses to use. Father, we, we want to say thank you for this message. Thank you for Mary. Thank you for her example as a woman who has trust in you, as a woman with a servant's heart and a woman who had deep faith that you would carry her through difficult situations that you led her to. Father, it's my prayer that I would become the man of God that you're, you've called me to be, that these people here today would become the people of God that you've called them to be. And Lord, help us just to have fun and follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and let you lead us without causing any doubts or buts or questions or what ifs and that we would just let you use us to make a difference in this world. Father, help us to become the men and women that you've called us to be. And Lord, I also pray for those in this room that have not yet become a follower of Jesus. Lord, it's my prayer that today, at the close of the last song, they would come forward and they would talk to our prayer team and learn how to surrender their lives to you. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.